Hey guys, Brad here from 4PlayerNetwork.com. These are my 10 favorite games of 2014, and I'm really glad that Earth Defense Force made it into this intro. Alright, I'm not happy this made my list, but I thought about it, I slept on it, thought about it some more. My number 10 is Dragon Age Inquisition. And I know, hey, a lot of other sites, it's game of the fucking year, and those are crazy people, and that's fine. But if you've seen me play this game, you know I've probably bitched more about this game. And I, I can bitch a lot. I'm kind of good at bitching. I'm like a I'm like a bitching pro. But I bitched a lot when I was playing Dragon Age Inquisition. But you know what? If you like fucking held a gun up to my head and said, Hey Brad, you stupid bitch, what's your favorite game of last generation? I'd be like, ah Dragon Age Origins, maybe. I don't know. Because that's how much I like that this universe and that game and and guys, I expected the world of this game. I'm not one of those people that hated Dragon Age 2. I'm one of those people, you know, who acknowledges the flaws. Like, I understand, you know, the repeated environments, they really sucked, and maybe you should have gone outside of Kirkwall more, and and I, I get that. And then when I saw that they were making these huge environments, they were turning Dragon Age into fucking Skyrim, I was like, oh, it's going to be Skyrim, but all, with all the awesome, you know, characters and story and side quests that Bioware is really good at, and it was going to be, it was going to be the perfect game, and I, I was so... God damn excited and, and god damn it guys I mean just a list a list of shit that pissed me off you know these filler ass side quests you know the complete lack of dialogue with anything outside of your core party members this fucking battle system that was completely gimped by the removal of the tactics system the tactics menu I should say it just, it killed me. It killed me inside because these were changes that I didn't understand. Sacrifices that I didn't realize had to be made, apparently. Because I can't, I can't justify it any other way. Like, it had to have been removed, right? Because why else? Why else? Why else would fucking hats clip through the NPCs' heads and ears? And I, Okay, I did like this game. The reason it's on my list is because I really enjoyed exploring these very large and beautiful environments. Dragon Age 1 and 2 are very flat games, very corridory, and I will say that the environments are, are, are one of the most forgettable parts of, these, of those games. Dragon Age Inquisition has big, beautiful environments that are that are very, you know, natural looking. You know, there's there's verticality, and, and they let the player finally jump to get around these obstacles and kind of climb up things, and that's important in 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 creating a not just a believable world, but a world that the player cares about, and and I really do admire that. And there are some characters. That I really did like, you know. There's some good character moments, like I think any Bioware game has. I just think they've done it so much better before. The fucking main storyline and the main villain are so bad in this game. They're so, so bad. It makes me want to cry. The way they treated characters that they wrote books for is really sad too. I'll never get over Briala's hat clipping through her fucking hair and ears. Oh my god. Do you know in the final mission of this game, the final encounter of this game, you do not have one single dialogue sequence with the final boss? It, you don't even talk to him. It just, god damn it, Bioware. God damn it, man. It, it's like, for years they've been fixing problems and creating new ones and pulling out stuff that didn't make sense. They did it with fucking Mass Effect and... Oh my god. I still like it. I do. I'm sorry. Sorry. God damn it. I won't lie to you. Some of them are grandstanding, hoping to increase. My number nine game of 2014 is Tales of Exilia 2. And this is a game, kind of like my last game, that I'll acknowledge does have some issues. Some issues that, that really kind of bothered me. 
But the reason I really do love this game is because, uh, you know, this is now the second game I've played in the Exilia universe, and I've I really attached to these characters at this point. And most, I think all the characters from the previous game are in this game, except now there's some new characters and there's this new version of one particular character that I absolutely loved from the previous year. And it just led to, I don't want to get into the story. There's weird dimension hopping, dimension destroying uh, storyline, but it just, it, it sets this, it sets the stage for these really great character moments that, actually have led to my favorite character uh, my favorite single video game moment of the year and if you want to hear me talk about it uh go download our awards podcast because it's a really great moment i acknowledge that this game does have some have some problems it, it can be a little grindy because you know they they sort of they cut you off like you can't do the next story mission until you've raised a certain amount of money um to progress the good news is a lot of those filler quests uh, that you use to build money, you don't actually have to do if you track down and kill, hunt down the elite monsters. And hey, because fighting things are the best part of any Tales game, I think it's okay that you know the the barrier to progressing is are defeating these really hard monsters because it's fun and it's it's challenging and it's satisfying when you actually get through these battles because it's a fucking Tales game. And that's what's good good about them. And and, and I love you, Mila Maxwell. I'm so glad you came back, but new Mila, you were awesome too. I feel so weird because this is such a, it's such like a, you know, an anime inspired kind of JRPG, but if there's one thing that JRPGs do really good, you know, and Persona fans can attest to that, it's, it, attest to this, it's just really spending a lot of time, you know, with with character development and you even even when these characters kind of at first might seem a little bit like genre cliches when you when you get to know them you spend a lot of time with them you fight alongside them in battle they become like your buddies man and and your waifus if you will i know i know the kids out there they love their waifus so when you have like these big story moments you know you care you care even though you don't want to care and you, you kind of wait till your girlfriend leaves the room before you you unpause it and watch your scene and cry a little bit but oh man I, Tales of Exilia is good at this stuff and this is kind of like my award for both games you know like how Return of the King won all the Oscars that year because it was the last one and everyone was like hey we should probably finally give an award that's kind of what Tales of Exilia 2 is I don't know if like, I acknowledge this is not as good as some of the other games I played this year, but it's definitely one of my favorite, and that complete package is probably my favorite Tales of experience. Really like Tales of Exilia, too. Nothing can stop us. Yeah. My number eight game of 2014 is Dark Souls 2, and I guess I should just fucking apologize now, because for some reason it's not cool to like Dark Souls 2 anymore or something like that, and... I know it's like not as cool as Dark Souls to some people and but you know hey when this series is still better than like most things out there in so many ways I think it's okay to still really like a game that's just a little bit not as good as the previous one they're still very similar in fact in a lot of ways I think Dark Souls 2 improves on you know some of the issues that the series has had since Demon Souls and I feel like it's finally it's finally at that point where it's not intimidating to kind of you know, look at the menu and the stats and, 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 and make decisions like, what do I want to make? Do I want to put a point into this or this? It, it's finally at this point where, you know, anybody can kind of go in and be a little comfortable with that. I'm glad they improved that stuff. They also really improved, I think, some of the, the online integration and the covenant system. That stuff was so confusing in Dark Souls. They were smart ideas, but I feel like it's finally gotten to this point where... You don't have to play these games following an FAQ or a message board. And that's great. I, that's a step up for Dark Souls because it's still like this really, you know, challenging, exciting experience. You know, just like in the previous games, you're clutching tightly on your shield as you as you round that corner because you have no idea what you're going to come across. And everything in the game can still kill you very quickly. And that's what's exciting about Dark Souls because not, not just that it's challenging and scary, but because it has the quality enough mechanics to support you know skill growth you know you feel yourself getting better at dark souls and it's shocking just how scared you are of something the first time you see it but 
but how much confidence you have when you're running back through an area, you know, that you've that you've already kind of stomped through before. And that's it, man. It's Dark Souls, and Dark Souls is fucking good. And this is more of it. And, you know, because these Souls games, like, every inch of these worlds are, like, a new experience, it means you can have a game that's still a lot like it's the previous one, but because, you know, all of it's new, it's just as exciting as exploring this world as it was the last one. And that's why I, I will always be excited about a new Souls game and why I'm very much excited about playing Bloodborne this year. My number seven game is one of the earliest games I played in 2014, but it's not surprising why the Banner Saga really kind of stuck with me. First and foremost, it's a strategy RPG, and hey, that's kind of my thing. My favorite game is Final Fantasy Tactics. But the battle system actually introduced some really cool, fresh ideas that I had not seen in a strategy game before. The, the whole, you know, your 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 strength is your health. So if, if you're almost dead, you're not going to do much damage. That makes so much sense, it's shocking it hasn't been done in more games. And there's other cool ideas to the battle system, like like the willpower is, is this stat you can use to kind of modify so many different things. Are you going to use it to move a little bit further? Are you going to do, use it to do a little bit more damage? It's just, like I said, it's really fucking smart. But then you get outside of battle and you start, you, you, you take your caravan and you traverse the land Oregon Trail style and you get into these scenarios where you have to make some really, really tough choices. Life and death choices that are so fitting with this setting which is pretty down, it's pretty depressing. You're just a people trying to survive in these horrible times where the dredge, these kind of unending, you know, assault of, of these zombie-like creatures are destroying the land and killing people, and all you can do is kind of run away from them and, 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 and recruit people along the way. It's fitting that it's you have this Oregon Trail style of punishment, and and you come across these scenarios where you think you're making a right choice, but all of a sudden, your star player in combat is just dead. Just dead without any fanfare. And and that 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 is so perfect. That is so perfect and fitting to this very dire setting. And it, it really leaves an impact. So you combine that story, that world, with a really innovative combat system. And it's no surprise that this game made my top 10 list this year. My number six game of 2014 is Shovel Knight. You know, man, I was not expecting to like this game as much as I did. You know, when, when I saw this game on Kickstarter and everyone was kind of losing their shit, and I just kind of rolled my eyes. I was just like, this oh, it's an old game throwback that looks like Mega Man. And you want to know a secret? I don't really care about Mega Man all that much. But then, you know, they started to release some trailers, and I was like, oh, well, that looks cool. That looks cool. And, and I started to see scenes and scenarios and moments that, that really were kind of differing from one another. So I decided to give it a shot. And sure enough, Shovel Knight is really fucking cool. It's cool because it has, it's not just Mega Man, it has some of the best elements of those old NES games uh, like Castlevania and Metroid and DuckTales. You know, these it's just a solid set of mechanics. And then you get into these levels, and the levels are creative they're 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 different like every level in this in this game kind of feels different from the previous one and they're really well balanced and it's difficult and it's challenging and they have that cool checkpointing system where you can kind of take a chance and destroy a checkpoint for extra money and, and, it, and it just felt good if there was one problem i had with this game it's that the bosses were a little too easy now they were really well designed there were some really cool inspired ideas and there were some really cool you know, design patterns for these bosses, but I beat a lot of them on my first try by just kind of brute forcing it. And that's not good design. It, it kind of wastes the potential of these bosses. You know, you need to fight these bosses a few times and kind of really learn their attack patterns. And it's hard to forgive that when the checkpoints were always right outside the boss boss fight. Honestly, this would probably be, probably be a lot higher on my list if these boss fights were actually a little more difficult. But outside of that, Man, like, it's really cool. Like, the music, is, it's my, probably my favorite soundtrack of the year. It, it's, it's just the, the fucking towns, they felt all Zelda 2-like, and you met this cool fucking minigame where you're flipping the bottles up at the ceiling, and you meet the girl and she dances for you, like, in all those fucking cool games that used to do it. Like, fucking Sukunin and shit, and 
Ah, oh, man, Shovel Knight. It's really, really cool. It just barely missed my top five because, like I said, bosses were just a little too fucking easy. A little too sloppily balanced, I should say. But, um, other than that, man, really surprised me. Alright, my list is getting serious because we're in the top five games of 2014, and my number five is The Evil Within. And I'm going to start out by saying I understand why people had some issues with this game. Technically speaking, it's a bit of a mess. The frame rate's pretty bad in, in a lot of areas of the game. You know, not Blight Town bad, but it's rough. And honestly, the letterboxing, the extreme widescreen, makes it kind of hard to get get your bearings on what's what's going on around you, and you'll often get kind of snuck up on. I don't know if if that's intended because hey, it's a horror game and boo, they want these kind of surprises. But it's something I eventually got used to. And once that happened, I realized, hey, this is this is kind of cool. It's like Resident Evil made by the guy who made Resident Evil 4, and but it's a little more scary, it's a little more of a survival game, you know, ammo's a lot more restrictive, and you, but it's it still has a lot of the charms that a game like Resident Evil 4 had. First and foremost, the variety. Going from one moment to the next, like every half hour of the game is different from what came before it. Even if you were like fighting enemies that you encountered before, or even bosses you encountered before, the setup was different, and it was always exciting to see what was new. Because of this, sure enough, there's going to be people who didn't like certain scenarios of this game, but there's, like I said, there's always something different around the corner. That's what I love about Evil Within. That's what I loved about Resident Evil 4. And I really did just like the the new approach to sort of the, the combat narrative. You know, at first it feels a lot like Resident Evil 4 until you're out of bullets. And then you realize, wait, I can't just, you know, upgrade the shit out of my Red 9 and never have to worry about bullets again. You had to get creative. You had to get creative with the environment. One of my favorite new mechanics is using fire to disable enemies. And even that's a limited resource. So you're always kind of making these, these life and death decisions on the fly, and it makes for a really, really exciting horror game. That's why this one, you know, climbed to the top of my list, despite the issues that I'm aware that it has. My number four game of 2014 pisses me off a little bit. It pisses me off because I don't understand why more people are not talking about Super Time Force. This, listen, I understand why some of you guys see me falling in love with some game like Legend of Grimrock and you're like, well, that's not really for me. But Super Time Force, it's just, it, it's a pretty straightforward action game on the surface. A side-scrolling action game, it can appeal to a wide audience. It's like Contra, except hey, it also has this brilliant fucking time mechanic. And that's really what makes this game so good. One hit, you die, except instead of starting the level over again or going back to a checkpoint, you can rewind. Except when you you continue time, you're not playing the dude who just died, you're playing another person. And now you're fighting alongside your past self. And you quickly realize that if you get to the enemy that killed your past self, you can save him and he becomes a fucking power-up. It's such a smart little loop that makes that leads to so many creative scenarios. And you start to realize that this isn't just an action game, this is an action game with strategy, with like puzzle-like elements and, 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 and getting through these levels and these really, really creative bosses takes, you know, a little bit of fucking brain power, yet the action itself is still really solid. You have access to all these different characters and they all feel useful and powerful in a lot of different and really creative ways. And you realize that, that the options are endless, you know? It's, I'm gonna rewind time and be the fucking dolphin with the machine gun this time because that might work well with this previous dude that left off who's shooting down spread fire and now I can beat this boss in a shorter amount of time. Which is the main draw of Super Time Force. A lot of these challenges, getting through these stages, beating these bosses, you don't have enough time to just do that with one character. So you can't just play a very clean run and not take any hits. You have to use multiple copies of your characters to work together to beat these bosses. It's like you're playing a co-op game with yourself and it's so fun, it's so smart, and hey, the game is really fucking funny too. Did I mention the dolphin with the machine gun? My 
My number three game of 2014 is the Talos Principle. Truth be told, this game probably would have been high up on other websites' lists if they didn't do their awards at the beginning of December. But hey, who am I to judge? Um, I'm glad I spent, you know, a lot of time at the end of the year with the Talos Principle because I really wasn't expecting it to be as good as it is. And it's my biggest surprise of the year. This game is... It, it scratched an itch that, that is only really well scratched by games like Portal and Braid. It is a puzzle game with with mechanics and, and the elements of the puzzle solving that are that are inherently satisfying. Like shooting lasers to solve puzzles is cool. Cool in a way that, you know, time and, and portals are cool. And, and then when you start, you know, sending them up into the air with fans and you got floating lasers all over the environment and they're connecting to all these laser points and the sound effects are going off. Joosh, 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 joosh. It's just so fucking satisfying. And, you know, it's but it's not just a puzzle game. There's there's like this other weird mystery going on and you're a robot and there's there's gods talking to you and telling you to do things. And he's saying, don't go into this tower. And then you start debating with this other person on the end of this computer terminal. And you don't know if he's an AI or a person. And you, he's, he's asking you, what's the meaning of existence? And you're like, I don't know. I'm just a fucking robot, but you don't want to lose the debate with him, so you're freaking out, and everything you say, he's like countering, and it's it's all really stressful, but it's cool, and it's mysterious, and then you go solve puzzles, and some of the best puzzles I've solved in years, and did I mention the floating lasers? My god, people, play the Talos Principle, it's so cool, I'm not finished with it yet, but I've played the game for 25 hours, I'm closing in on the end, and, and you know what, it's no less awesome now than it was at the start of the game. It's it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. I know it's $40, guys. I know it's $40, and for a Steam game, that's like crazy, but I promise you, there is a lot of meat there. There's a lot of meat on that bone, whether you're just a hardcore puzzle-solving guy, or you just like crazy fucking stories and stuff. I think it was like Nick's favorite story of the year, so just play it. It's really cool. The Talos Principle. All right, here we go. You knew these games were coming. That's right. My number two game of 2014 is The Legend of Grimrock 2. My God, this game is great. If you watch my top ten list from a couple years ago, you saw that Legend of Grimrock was fairly high up on my list. Well, holy crap. I never expected them to go this crazy with the sequel. When I first saw a trailer of this game, it looked like the first game, but with some new environments. What I wasn't expecting, and the thing I discovered like a few hours into, the, into this game, is that this is not just a straightforward dungeon crawler. They made Legend of Grimrock open world. It's like a it's like a fucking Zelda game. You're exploring these this 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 world, figuring out how to get into these dungeons and temples and crypts and stuff. And once you get in there, you realize that wow, this is this is as deep as you know like a few floors were in the first Legend of Grimrock. But placing it in this world, world filled with all kinds of mysteries and riddles and puzzles to solve and secrets to find, you know, it starts to feel kind of like the best Zelda game that we haven't played in a really long fucking time. That's how potent this the the cohesiveness of this world is. And it's filled with, you know, it still has that really satisfying combat from the first game where you, you know, it's it's kind of like an action RPG, but you have a whole party of characters and the make of that of that party means everything, but it's all really satisfying and and you know, this is like the only game where I wouldn't pick a human character because, you know, being a bug dude is so cool and rats rats, man. Every time they level up, they get a random mutation, which boosts one of their stats randomly, and that's just so fucking cool. I love shit like that. Do you know if, if rats eat cheese in this game, they have a random chance of getting a stat boost because they're eating cheese, and that's their favorite fucking food. How cool is that? Oh my god. Did I, did I mention how awesome the loot was? There's a lot of games out that do loot very fucking poorly. Dragon Age Inquisition is one of them. Every fucking piece of loot that I stumble upon in Legend of Grimrock 2 feels valuable, feels powerful. Like, like getting a complete set in this game really feels like an achievement in a way that, God, so many games get it wrong. Oh, I, I love Legend of Grimrock 2. It's it's a tough game, you know, especially figuring out these these puzzles and these in these in these chow, in these riddles and stuff are really difficult. But you know, you can make notes on your map, and oh, it's so good, guys. Please play this game, please. At this point in my list, 
If you didn't realize that Divinity Original Sin was going to be my number one game of the year, you probably just don't watch our live stream enough. I recommend you go over to 4pp.tv because we broadcast every night. And many, many of those nights were me spent playing Divinity Original Sin. I played like 120 hours of that game and like none of it was filler. In fact, I was recording footage for this video and I played more beyond the recording because Divinity Original Sin is so goddamn good. It's an old school throwback RPG, like a Baldur's Gate game, except it has a combat system that I love as opposed to a combat system that I really didn't like. That was kind of my big barrier to a lot of those old RPGs, but it's so great here. And it's great because of the interactivity you have with the environment, and most importantly, those goddamn elements. You know, I wasn't really following the Kickstarter very much when this game got kickstarted. It even was an early access. You know, I heard some good things, but I wasn't that interested. But then I saw a trailer, and in that trailer, they featured some the, the elements reacting to each other. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm gonna play this game. And oh my god, guys, I can't stress enough how cool it is to, you know, make, just, just, just make it rain. Just make it rain on the battlefield, and, and little puddles of water start spreading across the battlefield. And then you shoot a lightning bolt at some dude standing in that puddle, and it all branches off, and you realize everybody standing in that puddle of water is now shocked and stunned. And you're like, okay, that's, that's pretty fucking cool. And you're like, okay, well, well, what if... What if I what if I shoot an ice spell at them and then you shoot a fucking ice spell and and and, if, and the whole fucking puddle of water turns to ice and these dudes you know they start slipping and falling on the fucking ground and you're like okay okay I'm gonna fucking poison them I'm gonna poison them and you you, you poison them and then they start eating away at them and then you throw a fireball at them and it creates a reaction with the poison and it fucking explodes and that explosion you know sets off a, a, a an exploding barrel you know because the fucking fire trailed over over there, gas station action movie style, and it's just sort of these crazy reactions. Oh, didn't I mention that the fire also turned the, the water into steam, and then it created a steam cloud and made it harder to see, and then I zapped that with some lightning, and it created a fucking lightning storm cloud, it just started shocking everyone on the battlefield, and then I just said, fuck it, and I made meteors rain down from the fucking sky. Dude, that is like every battle in Divinity Original Sin. Elemental jazz is what I like to call it. It's so goddamn good. But that's not it. That's not all. It's not just the battles, which are the, hey, the best part about this game. Divinity Original Sin has a confidence, a confidence of systems and rules. It doesn't say, hey, you can only talk to this person or hey, you can only interact with this thing. It sets up some rules. It sets up properties to every item in the world. And, you know, it gives them a weight and it gives them like kind of like a, a status. But, but then, but that's it. That's it. You have the freedom to explore and to, and to talk to people. You can talk to every single person. You can trade with every single person. You can kill every single person. But the game doesn't care because it has a confidence of design. You can, you know, pick up anything you see. You can, you can create, you know, you can block passages by just putting items there because that makes sense. It makes physical sense and the game's confident enough to let the player experiment with that stuff. And that's what makes Original Sin so fucking cool. That's what's missing from a lot of Bioware games. It, it, it has it has the great, you know, you know, kind of big open world that you that you get from like an old school Baldur's Gate game, but but it has, you know, the interactivity of, of like an old Ultima game. And, and the, the possibilities really do feel limitless when you're when you're exploring this world and talking to these people. And hey, did I mention that this game has a really, really good story uh, that that is filled with these characters and, and, and it's it's well written and, and, and it's funny and, and, and memorable and, and I can't stress enough how much this is a complete RPG package. It's one of the best RPGs I played in years and probably going it probably has the best battle system of any party based RPG I've ever played. It's no surprise that this is my number one game. At this point all I can say is go buy it so you can come back to me and say, oh my god, Brad, you're right. And then we'll hold hands and we'll dance, we'll dance in the rain. We'll dance in the rain and we'll, we'll throw an ice spell. We'll, we'll all slip on the ice and it's just going to be so fucking cool. God damn it, Divinity, you're the best. That's it, 2014's over. My list is done. 
Sorry if I said you know too many times, but hey, what are you going to do? Thanks for listening. I'm ready for 2015. We got The Witcher. We got Metal Gear. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Peace out.